with the Engage Lab Manual. So can everybody see the uh, Engage Lab Manual? Yes. All right. So I don't have a PowerPoint specifically set up uh, for the digestive lab. I do, you know, for lecture, I have one, but um, the physiology stuff is going to be taken from your engaged lab manual. All right. So I'm going to go down through the text information uh, and tell you a little bit about what's going on with the digestive system and where you need to focus uh, in the, in this, and then we're going to switch over and I'm going to show you some slides and some models and stuff like that. It's not my goal to go over every single thing on all the models. That's, that's more so of your homework, but I will show you uh, some of them. Just remember that for the anatomy portion and the practical for identification to be reviewing, doing and reviewing your pre and post lab assignments. All right, just like last time. So the digestive system is composed of what we call primary and accessory organs of digestion. The digestive system is involved in several things as far as functions are concerned. You know that your digestive system breaks down the foods that you eat. You pretty much know that. There's a couple of ways that our food items that we consume are broken down. But the digestive system not only breaks down the food items that we eat, but there are specific organs and glands and structures that are involved in producing secretions containing chemicals that are going to allow us to break down our food so that we can absorb our nutrients into our blood which can occur in three major places in our, in our digestive system. So just to let you know, the digestive system basically is a tube that runs through our body. It begins at your mouth and it ends at your anus. It's a hollow tube. So along the length of that tube, the type of tissue changes, different types of glands change, and whatnot. For instance, in your mouth, you have salivary glands. So we're going to bring the salivary glands up in a minute. What does or what do the salivary glands produce? What's in saliva? Why is saliva important? You then have your esophagus, a hollow muscular tube you swallow your food through. It basically connects your mouth to your stomach. You guys know that. And then, you know, in your stomach, people say, oh, I digest my food in my stomach. Well, that's just kind of a generic term because the digestive process actually occurs along the entire length of the tube. So the tube from your mouth to your anus is called the alimentary canal. All of the organs that make up the tube directly are part of what we call our primary organs of digestion. And then we have some organs that lie on the outside of the tube that actually connect to the tube via ducts, like your liver and your pancreas and your gallbladder and things like that which are considered to be accessory structures of digestion, which by the way, also include your teeth in your mouth and your tongue and the salivary glands. They're not the tube itself, but they lie on the outside of the tube. So ultimately in order to digest your food, we have to do two things. We have to physically break down the food items that we're consuming. In other words, you don't just stick an entire hamburger into your stomach. You eat the hamburger, you chew it up, you break it up physically into smaller pieces. So when food items are broken up physically into just smaller pieces, it's called mechanical digestion. 
So that's pretty simple. Your teeth and your tongue manipulate the food in your mouth as you're eating. You chew it up. It breaks down into smaller parts. You know, that's called mechanical digestion. So mechanical digestion begins in the mouth. And then even in your stomach, as we get there later, you know your stomach has muscle tissue around it. It contracts and relaxes. It churns your food up, mixes it with what the, the fluid in your stomach called gastric juice. So that can help manipulate the food as well. So mechanical digestion is just basically churning your food up, helping try to get it into a liquefied form, and then maneuver that food throughout the entire tube of the digestive system. Chemical digestion, on the other hand, is a, the type of digestion where the specific type of molecules that are found in the food items that you consume are broken down chemically into their elemental components. They're smaller molecular components, the molecules that make it up. Just to give you an, an, an example now you know, that we're gonna go through. When you eat pasta or rice or bread, what, what makes that up? What type of nutrient, what, what type of food item nutrient makes up those food items? Starches. Starches, very good. So in this system, it's gonna really pull back some information that you learned way back in general biology. What are polymers? What are monomers? You know, what are polysaccharides relative to disaccharides and monosaccharides? Some names that you haven't seen for a long time. So when you eat rice and pasta and breads, you get starch. Well, starch is a complex carbohydrate. It's a polysaccharide. And it's made up of nothing but a monosaccharide bonded together thousands and thousands and thousands of times called glucose. Now, you heard of the term glucose before because that's basically our blood sugar, right? So in order to extract the molecules that we need for our cells to live, we have to break chemical bonds between the monomers, which are the smallest unit that makes up a large molecule, and break up the polymer into their monomers by breaking the bonds that hold the monomers together. That's called chemical digestion. And enzymes is what breaks apart the bonds. So in different places in our digestive tract, we have different types of enzymes. We're gonna learn where those enzymes are located and a little bit about what they do. So that's some stuff about the chemical digestion that we're gonna be learning, all right? So the enzymes are gonna break down our large complex molecules into smaller ones that our cells are able to use in order for them to live. Some of the molecules will just be building blocks so our cells can make new polysaccharides or new proteins or uh, when they divide and make a new DNA. Nucleic acids are polysaccharides. They're made from nucleotides. So all of these different types of polymers, our cells have to remake in our body and they have to get the building blocks for that. So some of the nutrients in the foods we eat are the monomers that we are chemically digesting apart from the polymers that we eat. Like when you eat a steak, you get a lot of protein. Proteins are made of amino acids. All of our cells need amino acids. All right, all right, Smith, because you, you had something uh, planned. When, when, you, come the, when you come in the room, please mute your microphone. It's the reason you bought it too. Let me see. All right. Can you guys see it again? Yeah. All right. So we basically are breaking down 
molecules that make up our food items and with enzymes during chemical digestion. So chemical digestion begins in the mouth, it continues in your stomach, and it continues into the small intestine. And we're gonna learn where those are. So as far as the organ classifications are concerned, we have primary organs, which are the organs that make up the tube, and we have accessory organs of digestion. These accessory organs lie on the outside of the tube, and they can be involved in both uh, mechanical and chemical digestion in our tube, which is called the alimentary canal. In your oral cavity, you have your teeth and your tongue. Obviously, they are involved in breaking your food items up as you eat. And that process, when we're eating and chewing our food up, is called mastication. That's what this word is right here, mastication. So we masticate our food and we basically mix the food with saliva. And saliva comes from three pairs of salivary glands that lie around the oral cavity, which we're gonna be identifying in a minute. And obviously they produce saliva, pretty easy. There's different substances in saliva. So those substances that are in saliva begin the chemical digestive process, but more than that, when we begin to eat food, we mix those little food molecule particles up as we chew them up, we masticate the food into little bitty parts and it gets dissolved in saliva. The only way you can actually taste something is if the molecules, the food items are dissolved in fluid. So the taste buds contain receptors that can respond to molecules that are dissolved in the water of your saliva. You can't taste anything if it's dry. It, it, even if you think, oh, I'll stick something dry in my mouth. The little bit that you taste from it comes from the, the small amount of molecules that are being dissolved first in saliva. So by chewing up your food, you mix your food with saliva. It forms a moist ball of food that is partially mechanically broken down but the enzymes in saliva also begin the chemical digestion of certain types of molecules in your mouth, which include a small amount of fats can start to be digested in your mouth with saliva and carbohydrates. That's why you taste everything that's sugary. You actually start to break down starch in your mouth with the action of an enzyme in saliva. So we, Mix the food up, we begin chemical digestion in the mouth with saliva, enzymes in saliva, and the food items are broken down to smaller parts and mixed with water in saliva, makes it moist. And so ultimately, those food items are forming little balls of food that's called a bolus that is then directed to the back of your throat called the pharynx and we then swallow our food. So you're swallowing your food down your esophagus in a moist content, a little ball, a moist ball of food. It's called a bolus. Now, let's see what the components of saliva are. I want you to notice on the physiology test. It's right here, straightforward, right in front of you. So in saliva, we have immunoglobulin A. This is an antibody. It's a type of antibody, basically. Immunoglobulins or antibodies basically help protect us against microbial invasion, pathogens. So these antibodies help prevent microbes and other pathogens from attaching to the epithelium in our mouth and our throat, our pharynx, and your esophagus, right? The epithelium protects our epithelial lining. We also have lysozyme, which is an enzyme. It's called a bacteriolytic enzyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that helps kill bacteria. Because let's face it, you're eating stuff and you, know, it, you, you consume bacteria all the time, but they don't typically cause harm for the most part because we kill them. We start to kill them either in our mouth or they die when they hit the, the acid in the stomach. But nonetheless, lysozyme is... A bacteriolytic enzyme, that means bacteriolytic means we kill the bacteria. We have a couple of major enzymes in saliva. Amylase, whenever you see this word, means that we're breaking down carbohydrates. 
sugars, polysaccharides. Salivary amylase is the enzyme which, which breaks down sugars. It's called a carbohydrate. That's a generic name. That means it breaks down carbohydrates. Salivary amylase begins the breakdown of starch in our mouth. We also have a lipase. Lingual lipase is an enzyme that begins the breakdown of lipids or fats. And any enzyme that breaks down lipids or fats are generically called just a lipase. And we also have buffers. Buffers that uh, are molecules that control pH. So basically any types of foods that you might eat that are acidic get buffered by bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is a molecule we're going to talk about more often from here, going from here forward. And it helps regulate the pH of the fluids in the body. So we'll see that again. So bicarbonate ions basically can absorb acid from foods that we're eating or consuming that are acidic. And it brings the pH up. I mean, let's face it. If you ever try to drink a Coke really quick, it burns the back of your throat. You know why? Because it's acidic. There's carbonic acid in it. So bicarbonate can absorb some of that acid and bring the pH up back to normal. Now, your pharynx is your throat. Just read through this little paragraph. It's not that big of a deal. But um, there's three parts to the pharynx. You're going to learn more about that in lecture. For now, you just need to know that's your throat. Um, and then we have our esophagus. That's a tube that you know it attaches your mouth, uh, connects your mouth to your stomach. And the process of swallowing is called deglutition. So there are three basic parts to the pharynx. The, the most superior portion is called the nasopharynx. That pretty much starts at the back of the nasal cavity. We then have the oropharynx, which is the back of your throat. If you open your mouth and look in the mirror and look at the back of your throat, you're looking at the oropharynx. And then we have something called the laryngopharynx. So we're going to cover most of that um, when we get to the respiratory chapter, and you're going to learn more about it in your lecture. But what happens when the food enters the esophagus? Well, the, food, the esophagus is a collapsible muscular tube so that when the food starts to enter the esophagus, which is called a bolus at that point, that moist ball of food, that we manipulated in our mouth, there are rhythmic contractions, muscular contractions that propel the food down the esophagus towards the stomach. Those muscular contractions are called peristalsis. So the peristaltic muscle contractions propel the bolus to the stomach. Now, at the junction of the esophagus to the stomach, there's a muscular it's not a valve, but it's a, it's, a, it's a circular muscle that can clamp off the opening of the stomach. When we have circular muscles that can close off the opening of a hollow space, they're always called a sphincter. So the sphincter muscle at the lower end of the esophagus at where it joins to the stomach is called the lower esophageal sphincter. I'll show you that on a model when we get done with this physiology. So when we swallow food, as the bolus moves down to the distal end of the esophagus, this sphincter muscle relaxes and it opens up the esophagus, the opening to the stomach, and then the food goes into the stomach. As the bolus enters the stomach, the sphincter muscle then contracts again to close off the opening to the stomach. All right, so those are called, that's called the sphincter muscle. Now, what about the stomach itself? Well, the stomach's involved in both mechanical and chemical digestion, by the way, because the stomach still has to churn up with muscle contraction, peristalsis, churn up the food that's entering the stomach, mix it with the liquid that's in your stomach, the contents of the stomach. And that liquid secretion in our stomach is generically called gastric juice. And there's many types of things in gastric juice. I mean, we already know there's acid in our stomach. Everybody kind of knows that. But there's some other stuff in our stomach as well, in our gastric juice. 
So the fluids can be generically called a juice. So if it's coming from the glands that are producing it in the stomach, it's just called gastric juice. So the muscle tissue along the wall of the stomach contracts to mix up the food items with the gastric juice, and basically it liquefies your food. So your food does not stay a solid. It gets completely liquefied in the stomach. The churning up of the stomach mixes the food items, the boli, with the gastric juice until it's completely liquefied. And that liquefied mixture is called chyme. So chyme is a liquid form of our food that is mixed up with all of the gastric juice. So here's the name chyme right here. So that's our liquefied food with the, with the gastric juice, it's called chyme. Now, the reason why that's important is because it increases the surface area of all the food substances in our stomach so that enzymes can start breaking down the bonds of the molecules that are making up the food item. So what types of things get digested in our stomach? Well, chemically, di chemically digested. Well, we begin the chemical digestion of protein in our stomach. So protein chemical digestion does not start in the mouth. It starts in the stomach. And it happens because of really two things. One, there's a lot of acid in the stomach and the acid in the stomach is called hydrochloric acid, which you may know already. And acids start to unravel proteins. These globular, big, long proteins are all uh, swiveled up on each other. So we have to unfold them in order for the bonds to be exposed for the enzymes to break. And that unfolding of a protein is called denaturation. So the hydrochloric acid denatures proteins basically exposes all the bonds, the peptide bonds, so the enzyme can go in there and cleave them apart like a pair of scissors, just cuts them apart. The enzyme that is involved in chemically breaking bonds is called pepsin. Any type of enzyme that breaks down protein is generically called a protease. And the enzyme pepsin is actually produced by our gastric glands in an inactive form. So look at this word, pepsinogen. Everybody see ogen on the end of that word. When we have ogen on the end of the word, it means that the enzyme is, is inactivated. So the gastric glands produce pepsinogen which is not activated yet, but when it hits the stomach, hydrochloric acid activates it. So the hydrochloric acid actually activates the pepsinogen into pepsin. So pepsin is the active form of pepsinogen. So pepsin begins the breakdown of protein in the stomach. Our stomach glands also produce, which are called gastric glands, also produce an enzyme called gastric lipase. Just like we have lingual lipase in saliva, we have a lipase in our gastric juice. And that gastric lipase helps break down fats in the stomach. So we begin to break down fats in the mouth. We continue to break them down chemically in the stomach to a certain degree with gastric lipase. We also have a factor called intrinsic factor in our gastric juice. As we get older, we make less of this. This factor is involved in allowing for a very efficient absorption of vitamin B12 from the foods that we eat. So B12 absorption occurs in a part of the intestine called the ileum. And without intrinsic factor, we don't absorb vitamin B12 very well at all. And as it turns out, in order to make red blood cells, we need vitamin B12. 
So sometimes you might encounter an elderly patient who is anemic and you'll, you, you might as well get used to it. You probably will have an order to give them a B12 shot. You might infiltrate uh, in an IV some intrinsic factor because as we get older, we make less of this, which means we absorb less, less vitamin B12, which means we don't make red blood cells, really hemoglobin in a red blood cell efficiently. And we may become slightly anemic. So sometimes as we get older, we have to go get B12 shots, intrinsic factor and all of that. So that is what's in gastric juice. So in the stomach, we actually absorb in the blood certain nutrients. And the nutrients, not a whole lot, but there is some absorption through the stomach lining. So we can absorb some water, some ions, some very short chain fatty acids, which are the breakdown components of fats. So these lipases are breaking down the fats and they can break them down into short chains. The fatty acid chains are parts of the fat, as well as certain drugs or medicines we consume and then alcohol can be absorbed through the stomach lining. And for that reason, if you drink alcohol on an empty stomach, you get drunk quicker because there's nothing in the stomach to bind to the alcohol and it gets absorbed straight through the stomach lining. So that's one reason why that happens. There's another reason as well. It deals with an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, I could email you that. I don't want to get into that conversation. But males make more alcohol dehydrogenase than females do. Um, so typically males can consume a little bit more alcohol before uh, they get drunk than females can of a comparable body size. So it's a pretty interesting concept dealing with that, those enzymes. If you're interested, I can email you that. That alcohol dehydrogenase is not going to be on our, our test though. All right. And, and that's made in the, in the stomach and in your liver, alcohol dehydrogenase. It breaks down alcohol. All right, let's talk about the liver and the pancreas. The liver and the pancreas are considered to be accessory organs of digestion because they're, they're not directly part of the hollow tube, the alimentary canal. They actually lie on the outside of the tube, All right? So the liver actually is a big chemistry set in our body. It, it's involved in several different organ systems, but also for the digestive system. That's why we're covering it because one of the things that the liver does is produces bile. Now bile is secreted from the liver down to the small intestine. And y'all might have heard of the common bile duct. I'm gonna show you some of the other ducts in what's called the biliary system as well off of models. But bile is a mixture of chemicals. It's made of some salts called bile salts. There's water in it. There's fats, lipids, carbohydrates, bilirubin, which is a breakdown component of red blood cells, all found in bile. So bile acts like an excretory product from the liver. We can get rid of some of this, this excess material because it's going to hit the, hit the small intestine. And as it passes through the small intestine, ultimately it's going to end up in feces. Some of the things we can absorb, but some of them are going to be lost when we go to the bathroom. So it's like an excretory product. But as far as digestion is concerned, bile is a lipid emulsifier. So let me explain that. Everybody knows that oil and water don't mix, right? You, you have a glass of water, you put some oil in there, and the oil is going to float on the top. They don't mix together. Oil is hydrophobic. Water is hydrophilic. And herein lies the whole problem with oils and fats in our diet. All of the enzymes that are responsible for breaking down chemically our nutrients that we need to live are proteins, which are water soluble. So it's kind of hard to get an enzyme that's dissolved in water to act on molecules that can't dissolve in water. Kind of crazy. So, <coughs> excuse me. So to increase the efficiency of chemical digestion of fats, we actually have to take the fat droplet 
which is like a little oil droplet when it's in our when it's in our system. We have to take those oil droplets and break them down into millions of very, very, very microscopic droplets so that we increase the surface area around the droplet for the enzymes to start breaking down the bonds because those enzymes can only work from the outside of the droplet inward because the whole droplet's not dissolved in fluid. So when you break down a large oil droplet into many, 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 many really small ones, that's called emulsification. And so we have to emulsify our fat producing a whole bunch of small droplets so the enzymes can act on it and break the lipids apart, break all the fatty acids apart. So the liver's making bile for us. The pancreas is actually two different types of glands in our body. In the endocrine section, we learned it was, has some endocrine tissue in it. Remember the alpha cells, beta cells, all of that? Glucagon and insulin, we learned. <clears throat> and the F cells and delta cells. But so that, that, those endocrine cells only make up about 1% to 2% of all the cells of the pancreas. The rest of the pancreas is made up of cells that produce digestive enzymes for us. And all of those cells are called acini cells, the acinous cells. So what types of compounds do those acini cells produce? And where do they go? Well, all of the rest of the pancreas is considered to be an exocrine gland. And all exocrine glands in our body have a duct. Like you learned in AMP1, a sweat gland had a sweat duct. An oil gland had an oil duct. So pseudoriferous and sebaceous glands you learned about in AMP1. So all of our salivary glands that we're learning today have a duct. Those are exocrine glands. So all exocrine glands have a duct that transports the gland's product to some site of action. So there's a big duct that runs down the middle of the pancreas. It's called the pancreatic duct. The pancreatic duct is delivering the fluid produced by the pancreas, which is called pancreatic juice. Just like we had gastric juice, we have pancreatic juice. The pancreas produces all of your enzymes that finalize the chemical digestion of all of the food in your small intestine. That's why you can't live without it. It's so all your enzymes are coming from here. So let's look at what's in there in pancreatic juice. We have bicarbonate, which again is an acid neutralizer because guess where the food's coming from? And both of these, by the way, get secreted into the first part of the small intestine, into the duodenum. So the food that's leaving your stomach, which is called chyme, is entering your small intestine and it's very acidic. All that gastric acid is entering your small intestine. So the problem with that is all of these enzymes that act in the small intestine, they don't work if it's too acidic. They get broken down. So we have to buffer the acid that enters the small intestine from the stomach, and bicarbonate is that buffer, right? It neutralizes the acid and the chyme from the stomach. Now, the next several enzymes are proteases. Trypsin is produced or activated from trypsinogen. Remember, ogen on the end means inactive. So trypsin is activated from trypsinogen by an enzyme in the small intestine called enterokinase. So you need to know enterokinase activates trypsinogen into trypsin. Now, this is one of the first ones that we have to activate because trypsin is a protease and it can help break down proteins in our diet in our small intestine, but it also has another role. Trypsin has the role of activating the other proteases from the pancreas. So what are some of the other ones? Well, look at the next one. Chymotrypsinogen is the inactive form of chymotrypsin. So chymotrypsin, chymotrypsinogen is activated into chymotrypsin by trypsin. So notice something here. 
The inactive forms all have this OGEN except for one that we're going to be looking at. And then the active form, you just take OGEN off the end of the name. That's all. So by putting OGEN on the end of the word, we signify when it's in an inactive form. When it's in an active form, that OGEN is off of the name. So trypsin activates chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, which is a protease to help break down protein in a small intestine. Another way we can signify when an enzyme is in an inactive form, instead of putting OGEN on the end of the name, we use the prefix PRO. PRO, like in pro-carboxypeptidase. By putting PRO on the front of this word, I know that this enzyme is not activated yet. So all of these enzymes, most of them, are being secreted into the small intestine from the pancreas through the pancreatic duct in an inactive form. And then they become activated once they're in the small intestine. So trypsin activates pro-carboxypeptidase into, you guessed it, carboxypeptidase right here, right? And carboxypeptidase is another protease which helps break down protein in your diet. Same thing with proelastase. With pro on the front is inactive. Trypsin activates proelastase into elastase. Just take pro off the name. Elastase is another protease. Generic name for any enzyme that helps break down protein. Then we get to pancreatic amylase. It's not secreted in an inactive form, but once it hits the small intestine, it continues to break down our polysaccharides, carbohydrates. So since it breaks down carbohydrates, it's generically called a carbohydrate, right? Pancreatic lipase is one of the principal enzymes to break down fats. We actually break down about 70% or a little better of all of our fats in the small intestine. Yeah, we begin to break down fats in the mouth with lingual lipase. We continue to break down fats in the stomach with gastric lipase, but pancreatic lipase finalizes the breakdown of all of those fatty acids in the small intestine. So since it breaks down fats, it's just called a lipase. We then have enzymes to help break down nucleotides into their main components. And at this point, most students have forgotten what a nucleotide is made of. They actually are the building blocks of DNA and RNA you learn about in general biology. But there's three major components to a nucleotide. There's a sugar, which is either called ribose or deoxyribose. There's a base, which are the letters of DNA and RNA. Remember ATCG? Those letters, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, all of that, probably forgot. Those are called the bases. And then there's a phosphate group. So three parts, a ribose or deoxyribose sugar, which is then attached to a base, the ATCG in DNA, or the AUCG in RNA, and then a phosphate group. So look at the enzymes we have here. We have a ribonuclease. You know what they begin to break down? RNA. It's a nuclease, but it helps start to break down RNA nucleotides. That's why it's called ribonuclease. Deoxyribonuclease begins to break down the nucleotides of DNA. So deoxyribonuclease helps break down DNA. Ribonuclease starts to break down RNA. Now we do have other enzymes in the small intestine that finalizes the breakdown of the nucleotides. But just know ribonuclease breaks down RNA, deoxyribonuclease breaks down DNA. You should be able to remember that because RNA is ribonucleic acid. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So the names tell you exactly what nucleic acid they break down. And that's why they're called a nuclease because they break down the nucleic acid, which is the polymer. So they break it down into smaller components. We then go from uh, into the small intestines with our food from the stomach. We have all of those pancreatic enzymes that act on the food which is called chyme in the small intestine. 
but the small intestine also has gland, intestinal glands that produce enzymes. These are called brush border enzymes because they're at the fringes of those microvilli you learned about in AMP1. The tissue, that epithelial tissue that makes up the small intestinal lining is a non-ciliated, simple columnar epithelium. So at the apical membrane of those cells where the microvilli are located, we have all of these enzymes in there. So let's go over them. There's alpha dextrinase. Alpha dextrinases help break, finish, finish breaking down chemically starches and other carbohydrates. So it's called a carbohydrate. There's maltase, which breaks down the, the disaccharide, which is a two sugar molecule. Two sugars bound together is called a disaccharide. So maltase breaks down maltose. All you gotta do is change that A to an O. Maltase is the enzyme, A-S-E on the end means enzyme, and that enzyme breaks down maltose, the disaccharide. Sucrase breaks down sucrose, which is a disaccharide. It's your table sugar. You put it in your coffee. You might put it on your cereal. Sucrose is our granulated sugar you go and buy. So sucrose is broken down by sucrase. Lactase breaks down lactose, which is milk sugar, disaccharide found in milk and milk products. So lactase breaks down lactose. Aminopeptidase helps break down and finalize the breakdown of amino acids from proteins. So it's considered a protease. Same thing with dipeptidase. Dipeptidase basically breaks apart a dipeptide which are two amino acids bound together. So it's still considered a, a protease. We then have a nucleosidase and a phosphatase. Both of these finalize the breakdown of nucleotides in the small intestine. Remember I said we break apart the sugar from the base and the phosphate group? Well, phosphatases are what removes the phosphate group, right? So all you need to know for these is there are nucleases found in the brush border of the small intestine. All right, now let's move forward to the large intestine. The large intestine, our large intestine does not make any enzymes on our own. So we don't make any enzymes. Our body doesn't make any enzymes in our large intestine. However, the bacteria that inhabit our large intestine can produce some enzymes for us. In fact, they do a good bit for us in our large intestine. So we actually uh, have in, uh, bacteria that are involved in the production of vitamins in our large intestine, some B vitamins and vitamin K. About 50% of your vitamin K comes from bacteria uh, in our large intestine. And we absorb them through the lining of the large intestine. So we can absorb some water, we take more water out, we absorb some ions, electrolytes, um, and then absorb some vitamins through the movement of our food items through the large intestine, which is also called the colon. And then once those food items, which is called a bolus, is having the water removed from it, it starts to become more solid. And as, as it approaches the end of the colon, we then go to the bathroom and we get rid of our waste product, which is called feces. Everybody kind of knows that. That's what we eliminate from our body. This is composed of excess material we don't absorb or non-digestible food items, which are all called fiber. Like we don't digest any, um, we don't digest any cellulose, which are uh, polysaccharide that forms the cell walls of plants. So when you eat salads and vegetables and, and things like that, you get a lot of fiber in your diet. Everybody knows that, bran, um, these types of things. We can't chemically break down that. So it actually runs through our system as a fibrous material. And we call that fiber. Um, so some polysaccharides are indigestible in, in us and also some proteins. And all of that indigestible food item is called a fibrous material and it helps bind everything together in our feces, right? Now, as far as regulating your digestive system activity, 
if you remember from AMP1, our digestive system is actually activated by the parasympathetic nervous system, which releases acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter. So our parasympathetic nervous system is activated to when we're resting. That's why you're not supposed to eat and then go run a marathon because you, your digestive system will be shut down. So the parasympathetic system turns on and we begin the processes of digestion. There's actually three major phases of digestion, which I forgot to mention earlier. There's something called the cephalic phase. That's where you're thinking about food or you're smelling food and your mouth starts to water and you're, oh, I'm hungry, right? That's because the cephalic phase deals with our head. We want, yeah, I'm hungry. I want to start eating some food. You're preparing for the intake of food. Your mouth starts to water, right? Your salivary glands are turned on, produces saliva. We then have the gastric phase of digestion. The gastric phase of digestion is the phase where your stomach is activated <coughs> and it produces gastric juice, your hydrochloric acid, gastric lipase, uh, uh, pepsinogen is converted into pepsin, all that we just talked about. Also, all of that secretion from the gastric glands is, is, is increasing and we start to churn, our stomach starts to, to growl. You notice when you're hungry, your stomach growls a little bit? That's because the muscle tissue in your stomach starts to contract and relax. Your stomach is also starting to produce gastric juice. And so as the food starts to enter your stomach, the food starts to absorb the acid in the stomach. It also starts to stretch your stomach. You put more food in there, your stomach stretches. So we have a couple of reflexes here. Just before you eat, your stomach produces all of that acid and gastric juice. As you begin to eat, the food items that are entering the stomach absorbs the acid. So when it, it, the, the pH starts to come back up. So when the pH starts to come back up, or we increase the pH, the stomach is signified to produce more acid. When your stomach is full, you put enough food in it. There's a stretch receptor reflex that starts to shut down the hunger sensation. So when your stomach starts to stretch out and you feel full, you become less hungry and the parasympathetic nervous system stops signaling the stomach that we want to turn up our food. So we have the sympathetic system actually turns your digestive system off. So when you're running on a treadmill, your sympathetic system is turned on and you're not digesting your food. The parasympathetic system increases motility through the system and it increases secretion of all the juices everywhere. So let's look at these three enzymes and then we'll, we'll start getting into some of the models. So gastrin is an enzyme produced by a, a cell in the stomach, a gastric gland. Yep, your stomach produces an enzyme. So gastrin is an enzyme that is going to be increased in secretion as the pH starts to increase in your stomach. So just when you start to eat food, it starts to absorb the acid in the stomach. Gastrin is going to be released. In the presence of gastrin, it stimulates additional gastric juice and motility to increase the gastric phase of digestion, hence the name gastrin. We then have cholecystokinin. That's how you pronounce that weird word. CCK is pronounced cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is not produced by the stomach, but yet it's produced by a gastric gland in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. So cholecystokinin is released when we have food items that enter the small intestine from the stomach that have a lot of protein in it, a lot of amino acids, and a lot of fat. And one of the roles of cholecystokinin is to get a contraction of muscle tissue around the gallbladder. And this is going to cause the gallbladder to release a whole bunch of bile down to the small intestine. Because let's face it, the only way you can efficiently start to digest fats 
is by emulsify emulsifying it first. And what is the emulsifier? Nothing more than bile. So the more fat you eat in your diet, the more bile you need secreted down to the small intestine. So it is kind of amazing that these cells know what types of molecules you are consuming. So they can determine if you have a high protein and high lipid rich diet relative to if did I just, you know, eat a spoon of sugar. It knows that you just have carbohydrates. So cholecystokinin causes more bile to be released from the gallbladder to um, the small intestine. Now cholecystokinin also inhibits the stomach from emptying itself. It basically slows down what's called gastric emptying. Since it takes a long time to digest fat, we want a high fat rich meal to stay in our stomach longer than going into the small intestine. We need to give our enzymes time to break down all of those fat droplets. So cholecystokinin slows down what's called gastric emptying. That's why when you eat a meal that's rich in protein and fat, you stay feeling full longer than if you go and eat ice cream or a candy bar or something or birthday cake. Your stomach empties sugar faster into the small intestine than it does protein and fat. And one reason for that is cholecystokinin. Now the other a hormone is called secretin. It also comes from the enteroendocrine cells of the, of the duodenum. This is a fancy name for the endocrine cells in uh, the duodenum of the small intestine. And so secretin is involved in stimulating the secretion of bile from the liver and the gallbladder and an increase in the release of pancreatic juice with enzymes, but also bicarbonate. So the, this hormone is going to increase the secretion of bile and pancreatic juice down to the duodenum because you're, you're loading up the duodenum with food items and we need to break it down. So secretin is going to be involved in getting these, the secretion of these substances down to the small intestine. All right, so that's it for that. The next section you can see is just all of the anatomical structures. Um, I'm not gonna make you learn, you know, the, uh, the teeth and the numbers of the teeth. So if they have this in that practical, I'm gonna curve that back a little bit. And then the last part is where, if we were in the lab, we would look at slides, we put the slide number, and we would learn a little bit about the slide. So that's what's at the back end of your digestive chapter in the engage manual. All right. All of that are the anatomical features and then the slides that we're supposed to do. So all of that information I'm going to look at from, where is it at? Here it is from the models book briefly. It's not my goal to go over every single structure on each one of the models. That's more or less your homework. So here's the model, where's the model's book? Right here, digestive system. Yeah. It's taken a second to load evidently. Here we go. The GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract <clears throat> is Act technically part of the alimentary canal. But nonetheless, there are several models in here. And you can see here, you know, everybody recognizes the stomach and the intestine and all of that, right? And the liver. Well, what I did when I made this book, we had a model in lab that was what I call the digestive board model. There was a head up here and then we had the rest of the system, the digestive system model. I couldn't fit everything very well onto one picture, so I cut the top of the model off. So this little head that you see right here is technically attached right there at the esophagus, right? So you can see there's several structures in here that you're going to have to be identifying. So your homework is to go through 
and learn how to identify these structures like the frontal sinus up here the sphenoid sinus and the sphenoid bone. This is where the sphenoid bone would be. Your brain would sit up here, it's been removed. This is actually the pituitary gland that we just talked about in the endocrine system, right? So some of these things aren't directly part of the digestive system, but I labeled them on the model just in case, right? This is the nasal cavity. You see the nose right here. Um, this is the maxilla, your upper jaw bone, the mandible, your lower jaw bone, you'll learn an AMP1, teeth, upper lower teeth, lips, right? So some of this is self-explanatory. The tongue in the oral cavity in there. Um, this structure right here represents that little doolally thing that hangs in the back of your throat. That's called the uvula, by the way. When you swallow food, this little soft tissue is pushed up against the opening of the nasopharynx. This is your nasopharynx up here. This is the oropharynx at the back of your throat. This is the laryngopharynx, all the way to where uh, the tip of the, the larynx is located. This is called the epiglottis. So some of this stuff we're gonna identify next week when we get to the respiratory system. So just go through and learn how to identify the components here. Um, I'll just tell you about the, uh, your tonsils real quick. The palatine tonsils are the paired tonsils at the back of your oral pharynx. And so this number 17 is pointing to the palatine tonsil. You also have a pair of tonsils at the base of your tongue, the root or base of the tongue right here. Those are called the lingual tonsils. And then you have the large tonsil at the back of the nasal pharynx up here that's called the pharyngeal tonsil up there. You also have a model uh, that shows the salivary glands and the salivary gland ducts. All of your salivary glands are paired. We have three pairs of salivary glands. The largest of the pairs are called the parotids and they lie just anterior to your ear. So just in front of your ear, if you palpitate on just on the really above your, your mandible and up in front of your ear, that's the parotid gland. And so the duct that leads from the parotid gland to the opening of the oral cavity is called the parotid duct. Um, this is the tongue up here. It's been reflected back a little bit on this model. And that little tissue that you see when you lift your tongue up that attaches your tongue down uh, to the floor of the oral cavity, that's called the frenulum. The frenulum, the lingual frenulum. The salivary gland that lies below your tongue are called the sublinguals. So here's how you're going to remember that. Below tongue means sub, I mean sublingual means below tongue. So you have the sublingual glands and the little bitty ducts are called the sublingual ducts. You then have a pair of salivary glands that lie below the mandible. Now the mandible has been cut away right here. This is where the ramus and body of the mandible would be right there. It's been cut away. So below the mandible, that those are your submandibular glands. So you just have to identify the glands, right? Here's the, the gist of the digestive system whole bunch of structures on here you're going to be identifying. You're going to be identifying the esophagus and the stomach, which has a couple of parts to it. This upper left-hand bulge of the stomach is always called the fundus. <clears throat> the middle part is called the body. It connects to the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. The pancreas lies just inferior and posterior to the stomach. You see that little white thing in the middle is the pancreatic duct. That little green thing right there, we can see better on a, another picture is a common bile duct. The liver up here has several lobes you're gonna be identifying. The two biggest lobes are the left lobe, more towards the middle or medial side of the body, and the right lobe of the liver, which is the largest. Just under the right lobe is the gallbladder, by the way. So your job is to go through and learn how to identify the different parts of the digestive system, which include different parts of the colon, the small intestine had, actually has three parts. I didn't point to all three parts, but they might want you to know that. So I'll just tell you this. The first part of the small intestine is a duodenum up here. The next part of the small intestine, because you see it runs behind all of this and then comes out here. The next part, which is just below the transverse colon, is called the jejunum. So all up here is the jejunum. And then as you start approaching the bottom down here,
This is called the ilium. All of this down here is the ilium. And so the ilium connects to the, the first part of the colon, which is called the ascending colon right here. It goes up. And there's a little valve right there. That number nine is pointing to the ileocecal valve. So we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and where the colon takes a turn and turns around right here, that's called the sigmoid colon. You then have your rectum, which is a temporary storage site for feces till you go to the bathroom, and then your anus, right? Now, I also didn't put on here these muscle tissues here. These are the anal sphincters. I think they're in, in some of those assignments, you have to identify them. So around the anus, this is the circular muscles around the anus. The ones that are closer to the wall are called the internal anal sphincter. And the one that is more away from the anus out here, those are called external. So close, if the pointer is in here, those are, that's called the internal anal sphincter. If it's more towards the outside, th those are called the external anal sphincters. And you'll see it uh, in the pre or post lab assignments, wherever that's located. I also put in here a, a increased view or really a, a magnified view. I took a picture up close just of this section with this part of the stomach removed. So this is the same model. It just, you can see a little bit more detail in here. So at the end of the esophagus, this little muscle right here is called the esophageal sphincter right there. You now can see the lobes of the liver with the gallbladder and some tubes that lead from the liver and or the gallbladder. So these little green tubes, which are not really green in there, but it's, called, it's part of what we call the biliary system. So bile is made by the cells in the liver. It's secreted from the lobes of the liver into a bile duct, into a bile duct. I'm sorry, a hepatic duct. And so there's a left hepatic duct, which we can't really see on this model yet. And there's a right hepatic duct. And the one coming from the right lobe of the liver joins the one from the left lobe and it forms this little piece. This is called the common hepatic duct. So you would have one from the left, one from the right, and it joins together to form that. So that's called the common hepatic. The duct that leads from the gallbladder is called the cystic duct, cystic. And where the cystic duct right there and the common hepatic duct join together See how it forms a little Y? From this point down to the duodenum, from that point down, it's called the common bile duct. So that's just a few things that uh, I wanted to point out. Um, and you can look up the rest. If I don't have the answers to all of these figures posted, I'm gonna go in and post it, the appendix, uh, which are the answers to my pictures. But all of these are also in the Quizlet. You need to make sure you review the Quizlet. So one thing I wanted to point out is this, there's a little band of smooth muscle that runs along the length of the colon. That little band of smooth muscle is called the tania coli, tania coli. And notice I made it like a multiple choice or fill in the blank. I made it more like a workbook. So you can see the names down here that go in the blanks and, and you'll have the answers when I post the appendix, but the, the colon, as you can see, is kind of strange looking with these little indentations. It's almost, it's partially segmented. Each one of these bulgy sections is called a haustra. I didn't put a pointer on them either. But that, this is one haustra. This is another haustra. It partially segments the inside of the colon. The invaginations of the smooth muscle in a wall of the colon. And it forms what we call the haustra. So each one of these haustra has some smooth muscle in it that can basically contract. And when they do that, it's called haustral churning. Churns up and moves the contents of the colon forward. So the colon, again, is this. Your food's going to come from the, from the duodenum down into the duodenum, down into the ileum, and then down into the colon. This part of the colon is called the cecum and coming off the cecum is the appendix. That's your appendix. This is the, lies on the lower right quadrant of your abdominal cavity. So there's a little valve here called the ileocecal valve. 
the, so the, the chyme would go from the small intestine to ileum into the colon, and then it would go up the ascending colon, then across your abdomen in the transverse colon, down the descending colon, through the sigmoid colon until we get to the rectum and then when we go to the bathroom out the anus. So each one of these haustra have muscle that contracts and it propels the food forward through what is called haustral churning. Now I have some models of the stomach. I don't think they use exactly the models that I have here, but pay attention to your pre and post assignments. There are basic things that you have to know on the stomach. You have to know the ends of it, the esophagus, or the, this is the esophageal end, the esophagus. And then you see the stomach makes like a, a J shape. So this large, uh, I'm sorry, this smaller little uh, crevice here is called the lesser curvature. This number five I tried to put here. The broad part that curves is called the greater curvature. Now there are three bands of muscle to smooth muscle that surround the stomach. So this particular band on this model is the longitudinal muscle layer, but it's one of the smooth muscle layers. The top left lateral portion of the stomach is always called the fundus, that bulgy portion up here. And then around the esophagus where it meets the stomach is called the cardia or the cardiac region around the esophagus. I don't think they're gonna make you identify all of these blood vessels on here, but this the left gastric artery up here runs in the small or lesser curvature. We have some gastro-omental vessels. Um, the one down here that goes up the stomach, this is the right omental gastric artery. The ones up here uh, around the fundus is the left gastro mental artery. I don't think they're going to have that. I usually, in a lab, when I set the practical up, you know, I tell my students that I'm, you know, these arteries are, are what I do. So you probably won't see those names <clears throat> in your pre and post lab assignments. But the, the last part of the stomach, from what we call the body, all of that's the body, not pointing directly to the muscle, but the body of the stomach, the last part after the J is called the pyloric region, and there's different areas of it. There's something called the pyloric antrum, and then the canal, and then, which is this just called the pylorus, and then we get to the duodenum over here. I'm gonna show you that in a second. So here's the esophagus. Now we're looking at the back or posterior view of the stomach. There's the esophagus again. This area, the last part of the stomach is called the pylorus over here. And then this begins a duodenum right here. And then you can see the left gastric artery a little bit better running in this lesser curvature right here. This actually is a branch of the celiac trunk you learned about on the first practical. So one of the three branches off the celiac trunk is this branch, the left gastric artery. And then you can see the inside of the stomach. I think that they want you to know what the rugae are. Notice the inside of the stomach's not flat. There's just little invaginations everywhere. Those are called rugae. Specifically in the stomach, it's called gastric rugae. Where the esophagus joins to the stomach, there's a circular muscle right here that clamps off the opening of the stomach. That's called the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, you have a pyloric antrum, which is a larger part just past the J in the stomach. That's called the antrum. And then leading up to this circular muscle called the pyloric sphincter, this is called the canal, the pyloric canal. So all of that's called the pylorus, the antrum, and then the canal. This circular muscle would go around this way, clamps off the opening of the stomach to the duodenum. So in order for food to go from the stomach into the duodenum, this pyloric sphincter has to relax. And when it relaxes, it opens up and the stomach contracts and ejects chyme into the duodenum. And then it contracts again, closes off the opening until the, that food items can move down the duodenum. All right, so 
there are a few pancreatic, sorry about that. There's a few uh, pancreas models. Um, again, I don't know if you're going to have to identify all the blood vessels on them since we did blood vessels on, uh, you know, the, the lab for the practical last time. Just pay attention to your pre and post labs when you go to identify the structures on the, the models, all right? Because those are the structures you're going to have to be able to identify on the practical. Again, I have more things labeled on the model than what is in the pre and post lab assignment. But if you can identify everything on this model, you're not going to get it wrong on the test anyway. So let me just tell you what we're looking at. This is the pancreas. There's three parts to the pancreas. There's a head, which is always attaching to the duodenum. So the part of the pancreas that is closer to the duodenum is called the head. You then have the body, which is the middle portion of the pancreas. It's just the body. And the part of the pancreas that is closer to the spleen is called the tail. The duct in the middle of the pancreas is just called the pancreatic duct. Notice it splits up in a Y shape right here. The other one is called an accessory pancreatic duct, the smaller one, an accessory pancreatic duct, All right? So this is the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, and you can even see inside the duodenum is not flat. You have these little ridges in there. Those ridges are called the plique circularis, which I don't have a pointer on, but I think that's in one of the pre-labs or post-labs, the plique circularis. And then you have these blood vessels. So I'm just gonna tell you what they are once. You can see them, look them up if you want. Um, the, the artery that leads over to the spleen is called the splenic artery. It runs on the superior portion of the pancreas. It's called the splenic artery. This little vessel right here is that little vessel right there from the posterior view. That is actually the left gastric artery. Then you have this branch right here that's going to go up to the liver. That's called the hepatic artery. Technically, the first part is called the proper hepatic. But on the test, I always accept hepatic artery. This little purple vessel is called the hepatic portal vein. Goes up to, really comes down from, goes up to the liver. This little green tube is called the common bile duct. You then have uh, the gastroduodenal artery right here. And then you have this piece that circles around by the duodenum and the pancreas. It's called the hepato, I'm sorry, it's called the pancreatico duodenal artery. It's a weird name. Everybody hates it, but it basically means it's at the pancreas and the duodenum. Pancreatico duodenal artery. Then you have the superior mesenteric artery and, and vein. The red one's the artery, the purple one's the vein. And this little purple vessel, which you see better from the posterior view, is the inferior mesenteric vein. So the only thing on this posterior view that's not on the anterior view is the splenic vein. All of these other things we just identified. This is just from the posterior view. Again, this is the head of the pancreas over here by the duodenum. The body of the pancreas is in the middle and the tail of the pancreas is by the spleen. And then this is the splenic vein right here, the only one we didn't see from the other side. So there's a couple more models that have all of that stuff on it. However, this model have the kidneys on it as well. So this is the right kidney on this side, this is the left kidney, this is the left lateral side over here. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidney. I know they're not part of the digestive system, but they're on the model, right? So that's why I put pointers on them and have you identify some of them because it's all on one model. Um, and on this model, you can actually see the, uh, the major and the minor duodenal papilla, these little openings right here. So this little opening right there is where the accessory pancreatic duct is draining pancreatic juice into the duodenum through the minor duodenal papilla. This one is called the major duodenal papilla because it's where the common bile duct 
and the pancreatic duct actually join together right there. So bile empties out here and pancreatic juice empties out there as well. So that's the anterior view, that's the posterior view of that model. And I think they're gonna have the intestinal model on there as well. Let me just show you what you're looking at here. So this is a section from the small intestine basically but it really shows the layers of the gastrointestinal tract, the tube. What are the layers? Well, this layer up here is called the mucosa. We have the epithelial lining of the mucosa. Remember all epithelial uh, tissues, not all, but epithelial tissues form lining epithelium to line open areas. So your food would actually pass up here. This would be the open area. So the first part's called the mucosa. Below the mucosa where the fat pads and large blood larger blood vessels are located is called the submucosa. Then you have the muscle layers. You have two layers of muscle around the tube. You have the longitudinal muscle and you have the circular muscle layer. So this is called the muscularis where the circular and longitudinal muscle located. And then the outer part of the tube which is represented at the bottom as this little yellow area, that's called the serosa, right? Now, these finger-like projections of the small intestine are called villi, villi, each one. In the middle of the villus is a green little vessel that's part of the lymphatic system. Those are called the lacteals. There's a little bitty muscle layer just separating the mucosa from the submucosa, and that's called the muscularis mucosa right there, right? Then you have your blood vessels. The red ones are arteries, the blue ones are veins, so forth and so on. You also have nervous tissue in the lining of the tube. That part of the nervous system is called the myenteric plexus. That's what that's called. And you're gonna have the answers to all of these when I post it. Um, the little green things that you see are lymphatic vessels running all through in the submucosa and smaller lymphatic vessels, like the blind ended capillaries here called lacteals and the small lymphatics running all through this tissue, all right? So all of the green that you see is part of the lymphatic system. And the reason why that's here and it's important is because we absorb the majority of our nutrients through the lining of the small intestine. And we absorb all of the nutrients that we consume into the cardiovascular system first, except for fats. All of your fats are absorbed into the lymphatic system first in your small intestine. So that's one view of the model. This is another view. You can see another structure on here that's a lymphatic nodule, but everything else is the same, all right? The last couple of models include the liver. So let's look at the liver real quick. Here's one of the liver models. The large area over here is the right lobe of the liver. Don't worry about all these little tubes in here. But the, this is the right lobe of the liver. We're looking at the posterior view of the, of the liver. And then, so what's on my right is right, what's on my left is left. This second largest mass of the liver is called the left lobe of the liver. And then we have two minor lobes that we can identify. We have what's called the caudate lobe, which is number five is pointing to the caudate lobe with a C. It's next to the inferior vena cava. That's the inferior vena cava. And then we have the quadrate lobe down here. It's next to the gallbladder. So nobody ever misses the gallbladder, but that's called the quadrate lobe. So you have the right lobe, the left lobe, the caudate lobe, and the quadrate lobe. You then have a little ligament that separates these lobes from each other. That's called the falciform ligament that you'll have to identify. So leading from the gallbladder is the cystic duct right here. Uh, this is a hepatic artery. The purple vessel is a hepatic portal vein. Um, we have another model of a, a liver here. Again, the posterior view, the right lobe of the liver, the left lobe of the liver, it's still, still big, but it's a little smaller than the right lobe. Then we have our two other lobes. 
by the inferior vena cava, you have the caudate lobe. Down by the gallbladder, you have your quadrate lobe. And then you have that falciform ligament, again, right there. Of course, on this model, it's not colored white, right? All right. Now, with that, let's look at a couple of the slides. Uh, but you're going to do all of your slide work from the pre and post lab. I don't think they have this slide that I used to use, but they might. I need to go back and look in there. But I'm going to tell you what, what some of these are. This is a slide of the liver. They're going to have a couple of these. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more magnified than this. But the liver have these little sections in them called lobules. In the middle of each lobule is a, a vein. It's called the central vein. So this would be one lobule. This would be one. This would be one. So, and you're going to be able to recognize the liver because you see these little squiggly lines in there, right? Um, this is the pancreas. We looked at already for the endocrine system. We're not concerned about the pancreatic islets now because that's where hormones come from, but we're more concerned with every, all the other tissue cells in here, the acini cells, which produce the enzymes, the pancreatic enzymes. This is a slide I used to use. I don't know if it, again, if it's in your image gallery or not, but I'm gonna let you know what you're looking at. This is the junction of the, of the esophagus as it meets the stomach. So the, the lining of the esophagus is lined by a non-keratinized stratified squamous. So this is a stratified squamous right here that you learned about in AMP1. But look at the lining on this side, it's real thin. That's because these are cuboidal cells with some columnar cells in there. That's a lining of your stomach. So this area at the top represents the gastric mucosa. And this area at the top represents the esophageal mucosa. Again, I don't think they're going to have that, but just in case, I wanted to explain it. Then you have a, a slide of the small intestine. You see the finger-like projections in here? Those are the villi that I was just mentioning before. So uh, these are, this represents the mucosa, all of that. You then have this muscle layer down here. I'm sorry, uh, the blue layer represents that submucosa. The muscle layer is that layer right there. I don't think they're going to make you identify that, but that's the mu uh, muscularis. And on the very outside right there is the serosa. This is a salivary gland. You're going to be able to identify that because you're going to see the salivary gland duct. There's a couple of different types of cells in here. Some of them produce mucus. Some of them produce a more watery secretion with enzymes. And so you see more glandular cells here, a little lighter, and then the darker purple. And then you see some other open cells in here uh, where mucus can be produced. So this is the identifying character that you're gonna see for the salivary gland. It looks different from the liver, looks different from the uh, pancreas, so forth and so on, all right? And the last slide that I have here in my packet is a slide of the colon. So this is a section through the colon and at the very top is the mucosa of the colon. Below that is all the submucosa. And in that submucosal area, which is basically connective tissue, um, is a lymphatic nodule. Now we're gonna learn what this is when we get to the lymphatic system. But uh, I always like to point that out when I would set this up in lab because it's a good identifying character of this type of, of slide that we're looking at. So you're going to be able to identify the colon because that mucosal layer have all of these little pits in it that you'll see. And if you're going through your pre and post lab assignments, the histology section, and you come across a slide that you can't identify, take a screenshot of it and just email it to me and I'll email you back with the answers. All right. All right. So that's about it for the models and the histology other than the few slides that I don't have in the packet. 